the Gecko session. Gecko is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo based in New Mexico. We have these sessions every week on a Wednesday uh, offering different topics. So the IBD session is usually every five to six weeks. And um, the chat will be open uh, for questions. And after uh, Professor Watermeyer presents, you are welcome to put your hand up uh, and then also ask your question. So today, uh, Professor Watermeyer, who needs no introduction to those uh, who are used to this platform, but for those of you who may not know, she's uh, an expert epidemiologist, uh, a consultant gastroenterologist based at Hoteskir Hospital in Cape Town. And today she's going to talk to us about immunomodulators and anti-TNFs exit strategies, which I think is a really great topic and we haven't really had opportunity to review it here. So as I said, uh, please post your questions online or we can have a chat uh, after uh, she has presented. Uh, Jill, we look forward to your talk. Uh, please go ahead and share your screen. Thanks so much for the introduction. Okay. okay, can you see my slides? Uh, it's yeah, it's 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 up now. Thanks, Jill. Okay, perfect. All right, so thanks uh, everybody for joining us uh, today, and I'm going to talk about immunomodulators and anti TNF exit strategies in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm going to start with the discontinuation of anti TNFs, and then I'm going to move on to discontinuing immunomodulators. Okay, so why would we want to discontinue an anti TNF? Well, there's there's many reasons. I think number one is probably the expense, and I know this is not just for us in state practice, but increasing problem in the private sector. Of course, TNFs carry the risk of severe adverse events, and I think particularly tuberculosis in South Africa. Other side effects like demyelination, worsening of cardiac failure, and of course, patient preference for logistical and social reasons. And there are still women that are nervous of using anti-TNFs in pregnancy and want to discontinue. So there is a crucial question. Can therapy be stopped once patients are in remission? And if so, how, when, and in whom? So what exit strategies are possible? Well, on-demand therapy, this is what we used to do in the old days. We'd give um, intermittent courses of anti-TNFs when patients had clinical flares. It's no longer recommended in any way because it carries a risk of immunogenicity. We can discontinue anti-TNFs in patients receiving combination with immunomodulators and persist with immunomodulator monotherapy. We can discontinue immunomodulators in patients receiving combo therapy and continue just with anti-TNF monotherapy, or we can discontinue anti-TNFs in patients on anti-TNF monotherapy. So stopping anti-TNFs in patients in remission remains a challenge, especially in our environment because we have very limited treatment options. The concerns with discontinuation are obviously the risk of relapse, a possible loss of efficacy if it's restarted, and the risk of infusion reactions on restarting. And very often, the decision is made on an individual basis uh, using one's gut feel, but can we do better? Well, the first evidence really came from the open label story study, which is already over a decade old, looking at 115 patients with Crohn's disease and corticosteroid free remission for at least six months. All had been treated for at least one year with a combination infliximab and an immunomodulator. After infliximab discontinuation, half of the patients already had relapsed by one year. And the predictors of relapse in the study was recent corticosteroid use. For some reason, male gender, hemoglobin less than 14.5, and absence of endoscopic remission and high levels of CRP or fecal pectin. Following the story study, there were a number of mostly retrospective cohort studies, which prompted some systematic reviews. <laughs> Is about 20% from there, 50% five year trials evaluating anti TNF discontinuation. They have somewhat different study designs. Um, all of these studies included um, uh, uh, patients um, with infliximab. Only one study also looked at adalimumab. Uh, three of the studies included patients with Crohn's, while two looked at ulcerative colitis, and only two of the studies were actually blinded. So I'm going to discuss these uh, studies very briefly. The first one to be published was the Stop It study, a Scandinavian study of 115 Crohn's patients on infliximab for luminal disease. Half of these patients were on immunomodulators. 
but most importantly, they were in clinical, biochemical, and endoscopic remission for more than a year. So they were in deep remission. And they were randomized either to continue infliximab or to discontinue infliximab and receive a placebo. And rather disappointingly, at week 48, relapse-free survival was 100% in the infliximab continuation group, but more than 100 50% uh, had relapsed in the discontinuation group. And the time to relapse was significantly shorter in the patients who received the placebo. The second study more recently published last year is the SPARE study. It's a multi-center open label study of adults with Crohn's disease on combination therapy of infliximab and immunomodulator. Patients were in steroid-free clinical remission for more than six months, and they were randomized into three arms, either continue combination therapy with infliximab and an immunomodulator to discontinue infliximab, in other words, go on to immunomodulator monotherapy, or discontinue immunomodulators and go on to infliximab monotherapy. And at two years, the relapse rates were pretty similar in the patients who received combination therapy and those who received infliximab monotherapy. And in fact, in those two arms, there's no statistical significant difference in relapse rates. But those patients who stopped infliximab and went on with um, immunomodulator monotherapy did much worse and um, had a significant increase in relapse rates when compared to the combination therapy or the infliximab monotherapy groups. The third study was the Hayabusa study. This was um, the only uh, study done exclusively in ulcerative colitis. It was a multi-center open label Japanese trial, including 95 patients in corticosteroid-free remission for greater than six months. So all of these studies pretty much used that as the criteria of entry. But in this study, they also had to be an endoscopic remission, which the authors defined as a Mayo endoscopic subscore of zero or one. Participants were stratified by the use of immunomodulators and whether the Mayo score was a 0.4% in the infliximab continued group versus 54 in the infliximab discontinued group, and a, a, a difference of 27% after being adjusted for immunomodulator use and the Mayo score. Interestingly, histological remission and a low CRP were associated with a low risk of relapse, but endoscopically remission a Mayo score of zero did not predict remission. The final study, which is um, only presented so far in abstract form, is from the large um, Spanish IBD group. It was a prospective randomized controlled trial, including patients with both ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, again in clinical remission for at least uh, six months on um, infliximab or um, adalimumab. They had very strict inclusion criteria for the study. Um, all patients had to be on a non-intensified dose of anti-TNFs, and in fact, the vast majority were on infliximab. The indication had to be Crohn's disease, not perianal disease, that were on a combined colonoscopy or MRE, and patients who'd had previous surgery were excluded. They randomized 140 patients to either continue the anti-TNF or to receive placebo all patients continued immunomodulators. And in a, a difference to the other three studies I've mentioned, there was really no difference in the maintenance of clinical remission or in the development of significant endoscopic lesions. So these relapse rates are obviously much lower than the other studies that I've mentioned. Why is that? Well, you can see the figures that I've highlighted in red, 84% versus 76%, 8% versus 19%. So, um, very possibly what we're seeing here is that the study was really too short to, to show a difference because those figures may not have been statistically significant, but they are certainly numerically significant. The study was double-blinded and also everybody had to be on an immunomodulator. So these uh, randomized controls trials prompted a very uh, recent systematic review and meta-analysis um, with uh, 733 patients, the majority Crohn's and the majority on infliximab. And again, all patients who were in corticosteroid-free remission for at least six months on an anti-TNF plus an immunomodulator. And they compared the three strategies exactly the same as was compared in, in, in uh, the SPARE study, continuing uh, combination therapy, immunomodulator monotherapy, or anti-TNF monotherapy. And one can see here, if you uh, look at uh, the patients who have TNF withdrawal, versus those who have continued combination therapy, there was a 2.4 higher risk of relapse when using immunomodulator monotherapy versus combination uh, therapy. There's no real difference in adverse events. 
And as sort of was expected, there was also no difference in relapse rates with anti-TNF monotherapy versus combination therapy, supporting something that we have known for some time is that you can safely discontinue an immunomodulator in patients who've been in remission for more than six months. And this has been shown in three other randomized controlled trials uh, that stopping the immunomodulator in patients who have been in remission on combination therapy for at least six months does not really increase the relapse rates. Um, two of these evaluated in Pliximab monotherapy, uh, combination therapy, while one evaluated Adalibimab combination therapy. And certainly in some of the trials, but not all, uh, combination therapy may confer more uh, favorable pharmacokinetic uh, attributes, such as higher trough levels and lower drug antibodies, which may, of course, reduce the relapses over the long term. There is a study which shows that um, as a thiopurine dose, in fact, can be reduced in patients on combination therapy. It can be halved. So instead of giving two milligrams per kilogram, you can give one milligram per kilogram. And that really doesn't rel uh, impact on the relapse rates or the pharmacokinetic profile. So what are the clinical predictors of relapse that we sort of understand at this point in time? Well, Crohn's diagnosed at a younger age because they obviously tend to have more aggressive and complicated, long-standing disease. Gender, some authors have found that males have a higher rate of relapse. Smoking is a well-predictor, uh, poor outcome Crohn's. Fistulizing perianal disease is much more likely to relapse than luminal Crohn's disease. The extent of disease in Crohn's disease you're more likely to uh, flare if you have extensive ileal and clonic involvement and if you've just got isolated small bowel disease. The need for previous anti-TNF escalation and those patients who already have complicated Crohn's of diagnosis, such as a stricturing or penetrating phenotype, because these patients usually require much more aggressive therapy. Laboratory predictors of relapse, low hemoglobin, high white cell count, high CRP levels and a high fecal cell protection. These all suggest, of course, that the disease was not really in deep remission when the patients were discontinued. High serum anti-TNF levels are a predictor of relapse because these are the sort of patients who need the anti-TNF to maintain remission. If, however, a patient has low anti-TNF trough levels, they likely do not lead, need the anti-TNF and they're in, in, in remission anyway. And then there's a point of endoscopic healing, and it does seem to improve things in terms of um, maintaining clinical remission, and it does seem to reduce relapses in if one just discontinues based on clinical remission. And this is similar in both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. We have a recent observational prospective study of uh, 80 patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, again in corticosteroid free remission for more than six months. Endoscopic healing in this uh, study was de defined as a Mayo endoscopic subscore of zero or a simple endoscopic score of Crohn's disease of zero to one. And they showed, interestingly, that partial endoscopic healing, which was a Mayo one or SESCD of three to four, conferred a higher relapse base versus patients who had complete endoscopic healing. A recent study which was done really to try and identify factors which would prognosticate um, and identify risk factors for relapse. So this was a large meta-analysis of individual patient data um, in 14 studies and the strongest risk factors on this trial uh, for relapse was a lower age at diagnosis of Crohn's, disease course of greater than five years, upper GIT symptoms and being on a second line anti-TNF therapy. Of course, the more risk factors that you have for relapse, the more likely you are to relapse. This is data from the story study that obviously showed if you have less than uh, three risk factors, you have a much more reduced uh, risk of relapsing within a year than if you have multiple risk factors, which intuitively makes sense. If one does decide to discontinue the anti-TNF, it needs to be very close monitoring, particularly of fecal palpitectin and CRP. Eight or 12 weekly. And if there is a sudden rise, particularly in the fecal cup predation, you're pretty sure that the patient's going to have a flare within the next uh, three to four months. And this is also quite similar if uh, there is uh, an increase in the CRP from uh, baseline. So if this happens, then it is prudent to perform either endoscopy or do an MRE. And if there is any active disease at this point, it should probably be a reinitiation of the anti TNF. All right, so from uh, the data in the literature, it appears that fortunately patients who flare on discontinuation between 80 and 90% of 
will regain remission be treated with the same biologic. So that sounds all good and well, but if one looks at the glass half empty, that means 20% of people or 10% of people will not regain remission, which in our setting is not that great given that we do not have many, many options available to us. So in terms of recapturing of response in case of flares, the data is generally limited to infliximab. Most studies report that 70 to 90% regain remission. The risk of an infusion reaction uh, overall on retreatment is about 9%. It is recommended to restart uh, treatment with the same agent that was electively discontinued. And following this continuation, if possible, take on an image. Similar data has been shown in two of the newer randomized controlled trials I've already addressed. Um, there were, the large number of patients were able to recapture remission um, in 96% in the SPARE study and 8 out of 12 patients in the high obesity uh, ulcerative colitis. Chance that you will be able to recapture. One of the more well known um, articles in this field by Philip Bert, um, who looked at 128 patients who stopped uh, infliximab. And the important thing about his work was that it showed that the reinitiation of the anti TNF with a concomitant immunomodulator significantly increased response rates. And the infusion reactions that were seen in, in some patients, it was the immunomodulator co which was the only predictor which prevented those infusion reactions from occurring. So really patients should be very closely monitored. This is the future of uh, the IBD situation. One can see you start an anti-TNF, the patient goes into deep remission, you can stop it, then you do regular checking of fecal palpitectin and CRP, and when it starts to rise, you don't wait for the clinical flare, you reintroduce the anti-TNF. So the take home messages about um, uh, discontinuing anti-TNFs is that patients really need to be counseled. They need to understand that the risk is actually extremely high and that there is a chance that they will not regain remission if they are discontinued. And very importantly, that untreated IBD, even if asymptomatic, can be progressive and destructive. And if we look at long-term follow-up of the STORY trial up to seven years, 80% either developed complication or actually needed to restart biological therapy. And if possible, patients should continue on an immunomodulator. Right, so discontinuation of anti-TNF should really be reserved for the minority of patients who are in deep remission, ideally clinical, biochemically, endoscopically, and if possible, histologically. Um, patients who have a very strong desire to stop treatment and patients who have no or very few characteristics of high-risk Crohn's and UC, these patients should also be able to tolerate a substantial disease flare. So don't put them at risk if they've got multiple comorbidities, if it's a patient who's perhaps more elderly and you really don't want to give them a flare. And they really need to be fully informed of the risks of therapeutic withdrawal. Um, and uh, one, as I said, can safely discontinue immunomodulators from anti-TNF combination therapy, but the corollary is not true. One really shouldn't discontinue with possible anti-TNFs and continue patients just on an immunomodulator. Okay, so the second part of my talk is discontinuing immunomodulators. And I'll start this one with a clinical case. You will note that I didn't start the anti-TNF discontinuation with a clinical case because in our situation, we've never discontinued. Our patients are too complicated. We wouldn't ever dream of stopping the anti-TNF in these patients who have a hard fought remission. But it's a different scenario with our immunomodulators. So this is a 74-year-old woman. She's on a state pension. She's a smoker. She has a medical history of hypertension, of uh, metabolic uh, liver disease, of osteopenia. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1984 at the age of 34. <clears throat> it was an ileocecal location. She had a normal colon. In 1994, 10 years after diagnosis, she had her first terminal ileal sequel resection for small bowel obstruction due to a stricter, and this was followed three years later by a near-terminal ileal resection with primary anastomosis, again for the development of a stricter. With these recurrent phases of disease, she was started on azathioprine. Um, in 1997. This was switched to 6 mecaptopurine in 2005 when she started to develop upper GIT side effects and she did very well on 6-MP. 
Unfortunately, her GIT notes went AWOL from 2005 until 2019, even though we know that she was seen very regularly at our clinic. In 2009, she was admitted with diarrhea and rectal bleeding. Colonoscopy showed post-operative recurrence of the Crohn's, a Rutgers I3 score. The dose of 6 mercaptocurine was increased to 125 milligrams. She did very well. Her symptoms resolved. She had a colonoscopy in November of 2021, and that's the report, which really showed mild erythema at the um, ileocolonic anastomosis with no um, obvious ulcers. The um, mucosa looked normal, but one couldn't get in to the neoterminal ileum because it was quite narrowed. And the biopsies of the neoterminal ileum and the colon were within normal limits. She also had an MRE, which showed no active Crohn's disease in the neoterminal ileum, and she was also in biochemical remission. In June 2022, she had her regular um, thiopurine uh, bloods. She was noted to have an anemia, um, a low white cell count, a low platelet count, and she had um, a high MCV. That shows that uh, her um, uh, 6 mercaptopurine is therapeutic. All right. And she had a an, an, uh, neutropenia and lymphopenia on her diff. Her iron studies were unremarkable. She did have raised ferritin and her B12 and folate levels were normal. So what would you do now? Stop the 6 mercaptopurine period for one week, check the white cell count, and if it's okay, restart at a lower dose. Stop the 6MP permanently, switch to methotrexate, or start an anti-TNF. So why would one ever want to discontinue a thiopurine monotherapy? Well, as I've shown you in this case, you can get neutropenia even after years of having been on therapy. So this requires indefinite monitoring. You never get off the hook. You have to do this at least every six months. There is, of course, a cumulative risk of lymphoproliferative disease as well as non-melanoma skin cancer. The ECHO guidelines published some years ago um, does uh, suggest that there is a cumulative risk of relapse of time after draw, withdrawal of uh, uh, thiopurines in both uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, with approximately 30% of patients relapsing by two years and 50 to 75% undergoing a relapse thereafter. Okay, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis showed that discontinuation of thiopurine monotherapy confers a twofold increase in relapse rates within 24 months when compared to ongoing therapy. And a prospective study of 66 patients with Crohn's disease on azathioprine with a median duration of 68 months. So this are patients that have been on Aza for a long time. The cumulative probabilities of relapse after discontinuation were 14% at one year, 53% at three years, and 63% at five years. So one can see here that the rates of relapse are very high, even if the patients have been on a thiopurine for a prolonged period of time. So one really does need to be very cautious about the decision of thiopurine in a patient, even if they've been in remission for many years. What about ulcerative colitis? Well, there is an observational retrospective study of 127 patients in steroid free clinical remission at the time of withdrawal of azathioprine. A third of the patients relapsed within 12 months, half relapsed within two years, and two thirds relapsed within five years. There is also a randomized controlled trial, it's a pretty old one, um, of azathioprine withdrawal in ulcerative colitis in short term remission. And again, one year relapse rates of 59% were noted with azathioprine withdrawal compared to 36% in patients who continued therapy. We also now have a recent prospective study of 57 patients on azathioprine for more than five years. All of these were in deep remission, clinical, endoscopic, histologic, and biological, including a fecal cell protection below 50 and a CRP below 10. And a considerable number of patients relapsed, 58% in ulcerative colitis and 31% in patients with Crohn's disease. So whether longer term remission justifies their withdrawal is a little bit contentious because there's still a chance that they are going to flare, even if they've been doing really well for prolonged periods of time. Okay, so these are some of the factors that predict um, 
relapse rate in Crohn's disease. And you'll see that pretty much all of these are associated with active disease. So elevated CRP, increased white cell count, low hemoglobin, and in ulcerative colitis, an increased leukocyte count, number of relapses on azathioprine, and shorter duration of azathioprine. The efficacy of retreatment for relapse. Evidence of retreatment after uh, discontinuation is scarce. In a study of 66 Crohn's disease patients in sustained remission for a prolonged period of time, 32 patients relapsed after discontinuation of azathioprine. 96% who were uh, retreated with azathioprine did regain a remission. However, the study did not include patients with perianal disease or previous surgery. But this was quite reassuring that one can actually uh, retreat patients successfully. A multi-center retrospective cohort study in the UK followed up UC and Crohn's disease patient after discontinuation of thiopurines, and 74% of patients resumed uh, immunomodulus uh, laters at relapse regained and maintained remission, mostly in combination with other therapies. What about methotrexate? Well, there are no prospective studies on methotrexate withdrawal in Crohn's disease. Just one single retrospective study of 70 patients already done a long time ago. Uh, 48 had Crohn's, 22 had ulcerative colitis, and um, they reported a very high risk of relapse on stopping methotrexate, approximately 80% at 12 months. So a risky business in this group of patients, but uh, very poor data to actually support that. So the take home messages really are risk of relapse on stopping thiopurines is very high in patients on monotherapy. And this is even in patients who are in deep remission and regardless of the duration of that mission. So patients really need to be part of the decision making process, just like stopping an anti TNF. They need to understand that there's a risk here. So be very cautious of stopping thiopurines. Consider long term therapy unless there is uh, some kind of a contraindications. Um, and if they are stopped, you need to monitor very closely for a relapse. But fortunately, there is a very high recapture rate between 70 and 90%. That sounds great, but again, a glass half empty, that means up to 30% of patients will not regain response. And in our setting of very uh, resource limited uh, environment, where we only really now have as a 5 and 6 mecaptopurine and methotrexate at our disposal, anti TNFs have been taken away completely from state practice. Uh, this is problematic. Um, some patients may need to be discontinued, and in my practice, these are the only ones I ever would discontinue. They would be the older patients where you're running the risk of malignancy, young males where you run the risk of hepatosplenic T-cell lymphomas and lymphomas. There's really little data on methotrexate, but the relapse rates also appear to be pretty high. All right, so our patient, remember I said, what should we do now? Stop 6MP for one week, check the white cell count, and if okay, restart at a lower dose. Stop the 6MP permanently, switch to methotrexate, start an anti-TNF. And perhaps we can talk about this in the discussion. I will tell you what we decided to do. We decided to stop her 6 mecaptopurine She'd been an under for a very long time, and she was now starting to get older. And there was rapid normalization of her hematological abnormalities. She has been closely monitored with regular CRPs and fecal health protectants, and she remains in clinical biochemical remission. But as I've shown you with the data, there is still a very high chance that she is going to have a relapse, and we will have to readdress this in the future. Unfortunately, we don't have much options if she fails. Um, we really wouldn't want to start her back on azathioprine again, because she's now had a neutropenia and she's at advanced age. Methotrexate's a would be an option, but of course it's a drug that has to be discontinued in about 30% of patients because of the side effect profile. And as I said, for us in state practice at the moment, anti-TNFs are rapidly becoming a distant dream and any more of the new advanced therapies are actually out of the question. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Thank you so thank much. You. And for a comprehensive, uh coverage of uh, really difficult uh, decisions that one has to make, especially when uh, resources are limited. I mean, as you correctly point out, when you have options um, that you can use, then making the decision to stop uh, an anti-TNF or uh, a thiopurine for whatever reason makes life a lot easier um, when you have access to all of these drugs. But uh, in the state sector, it really, really is difficult. And we've defaulted to relying on the thiopurines because that's, that's all that we have. But when you're faced with a patient like this who's older, 
um, and who's developed the side effects uh, from the 6NP, you're kind of stuck as to what you need to do. And I must say, I have to agree that in her, in her we had no choice. So one had no choice but to stop the 6NP. And because of her nephil D, or I should call it methyl D now, um, methotrexate was probably out of the question, unless maybe we did a fibro scan to understand what the fibrosis was, et cetera. So um, it, it can be debatable. Um, and yeah. yeah her last, last LFTs were actually okay. So I think if push comes to shove, we're probably going to be forced to go low methotrexate route. Not great. To, yeah. Not great, but. Yeah. Um, Kay, hi. I see you have your hand up. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Jill, thanks for, for, ever, as a, for a great talk. Just a comment, really, that those studies are all done in Europe where access to biologics, et cetera, is much easier. And I don't have any data to support it, but I would suggest that in our patient population or on biologics, the relapse rate is probably going to be higher because they've had to really, really earn their biologic in the first place. So unfortunately, we don't have the data, but that would be my guess. And I wish um, Discovery were on this call because at the moment it's a disaster, as, I I, so. as you know. I hear so, and it's going to be lots of problems down the line for these poor unfortunate patients. I absolutely agree with you, Kay. And I must say, um, in our um, group of uh, anti-TNF patients, of which we have quite a lot, but sadly, we're never going to increase those numbers since the uh, provincial administration has completely taken biologics off the table for us. Uh, so we've actually never discontinued a case of anti-TNF. No. That's why I actually... Didn't, I couldn't find a case to present with first because we don't, because by the time our patients hit an anti-TNF, they've really earned it. They just cannot. Yeah. I wouldn't dream of discontinuing them if they yeah. are in some form of a remission, and I'll take any remission at all. Uh, yeah, Chris, I've noted your hand, but Jill, you also said an important point that even though the studies say that you can recapture a remission and whatnot, in these patients, you can ill afford even a period of no therapy because loss of bowel function, uh, complications, hospitalization, increased costs, more complications. So you simply couldn't uh, in this cohort of patients, I don't think. Absolutely. And, you know, the and um, our um, anti-TNFs, you're only going to really see proper benefit in about two to three months. And, of course, um, as a thyperin, we all know that that takes a long time before it kicks in. So if you stop it and the patient flares, they're really going to be without effective therapy as such for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. Chris, uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Oh, thanks. For Excellent talk, really, but to put it into perspective. We have no experience of stopping uh, uh, biologics, but it was in the early phases when we had to say, although 70 to 80 percent may recapture, sometimes it's, it's not a matter of just putting them back on their biologic and they sail away. It can be very, very difficult to achieve real, uh, you know, remission and also some response rates. But the two, two factors which I really want to emphasize, which you did, um, you did say, was the fact that use fecal calprotectin firstly as a marker of relapse and treat before symptoms come, your, your um, recapture will be a lot easier. And logic when you, when you retreat is also very important. I think those patients that we stopped and uh, we restarted therapy, we weren't using fecal calprotectin as an early marker of relapse, and also we weren't using combined immune immunomodulator and biologic therapy. So I think those two points are very important to emphasize. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think by the time you wait for a clinical flare, the ship has sailed. So, I mean, this is the concept of cycling therapies, um, which is where you start a therapy when the patient's in deep remission, you can do a drug holiday, monitor them very closely with fecal calprotectin and CRP. And if it starts to increase, go straight back in with the, with the drug again, not waiting until there is a clinical flare up or complication. So, this really is um, how it's going uh, with IBD, but it's all very good and well in our, our colleagues who live in these resource-rich countries where if the biologic fails, they have an option. Oh, let's just use some betalizumab. Um, why don't we pop in a bit of topocytin? Yeah, for us, it's just not a reality. We've got to be really, really careful. Uh, Chris, can I ask? I mean, your patients are... Um... Jill, I was going to ask you about... Uh, yeah. 
um, you want to go ahead? Because um, your internet connection is very unstable. Go ahead. Yeah, we're kind of losing oh, you. Sorry, can't you hear me? It's a bit better now. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, I'm I was sorry. Going to ask you that your patients have options. I, don't know. I, I was going Relative to ask you about recycling because it might be important in. Yes, I think turn your video off. Sometimes that improves the the bandwidth. Yeah. Hi, uh, Chris, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I can hear you well. Uh, go ahead, Chris. I think you were trying to say something. All right. While we wait for Chris to come back, Ernst, um, I was wondering, um, what uh, uh, experience you can share maybe with patients where you were able to, to stop NTTNFs for whatever reason uh, and, and how they did, um, because you know you have quite a lot of experience uh, with, the, um, with the biologics. Hi everyone, yes. It, you know, we, these days we don't really stop anti-TNFs at all. If they are on it, they do well. We, we somehow continue treating them. In the older days, we used to stop. And I, you know, we've, uh, Joel has shown the data that, that about 50% of them will relapse within a year if, if you discontinue an anti-TNF. Those are just the numbers. So, so you really have to be absolutely certain they are in remission before you, before you decide to discontinue uh, whichever one. Maybe these days we can just get away with an immunomodulator discontinuation. But I think if you if they're doing well on an anti-TNF, I will just keep them on an anti-TNF and not stop it if I can help it. That's That would be Definitely. my take. Unless the patient requests it, which I suppose is an entirely different, different situation. Story. Yes. Yeah. So Jill, when you restart, assuming you were able to stop and you restart, so you recapture a response uh, with the same agent. Does that include biosimilars, or that has never? Yes, yes, absolutely. Biosimilars are they're interchangeable. I I have no problem interchanging them. <laughs> okay. Um, and another question I have is that from the data you presented, one might assume that in fact stopping uh, thiopurines is more problematic in terms of the relapse, in terms of the time period of the relapse compared to the anti-TNS. Is that a correct assessment of uh, your data? Absolutely. So in other words, you can be in, like our patient was, she'd been on this drug for the better part of half a century, uh, sorry, quarter of a century. And it's all those years later, she has a relapse. So, um, you know, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, other... It would be great if you could say, oh, a patient's been in deep remission for five years, and um, you know, there's a good chance now that if we stop as a thyperin, that we'll have the response. We know that that's not true. Yeah. Um, Chris said he wanted to elaborate on cycling. Maybe he'll come back or he'll type some more. While he's doing um, that... Yes, Chris, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm going to generate, so I switched to 5G. Uh, Jill, okay. I wonder if you could elaborate on, on cycling, because in this cost-effective drive that we're experiencing with Discovery, we might actually have to negotiate a package for, a, for you know, an annual package, and we might be able to have a lot more freedom on how we want to use biologics, and cycling, recycling might be something we want, want to explore. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it is an option that is coming to the fore. It's certainly gaining popularity in, in the literature. And uh, um, there is the, the BioCycle project, which is going on, of which the SPARE study was a, a part of that. And uh, I think the key to that is that patients have to be in deep remission before you stop them. And you've got to monitor them like a hawk with a very low threshold to reintroduce. Now, in that Spanish study I mentioned, the exit trial, that was really the only one where they managed to have lower relapse rates. And those patients were really carefully selected. So they um, had luminal disease. They 
had, were on their first anti-TNF. They had no dose escalation, no surgery. You know, and those are the patients that I think you can get away with it. I don't think you've got a chance of getting away with it in somebody who's had two surgeries in the past or has had very complex penetrating yeah. disease. So I think, um, yeah. Okay, Kay, interesting, interesting question. I guess this is one place that in the state we are a little bit better off than you. We can get fecal calprotectins every three months if we want and CRPs as often as we want. Uh, you can get them in private, but the medical aid grant fund them. And, and, and in fact, only this year they funded fecal calpros for most patients. Really? Yeah. I don't and think they pay from themselves. And I think it's, I don't know what it costs because uh, I'm not privy to that at it, it here, but I, I don't think it's a cheap thing, is it? No, it's not cheap. Oh. No, I don't know the, I don't know this year's figures, but it's not cheap. 800 then. Yeah. Really? That's, yeah. Mish, sorry, I can't get my hand up. Uh, but can I ask a question quickly? Oh. So, sorry, Joe, thank you. Uh, and Kay also. I am sh I'm actually not sure about pricing, what anti-TNF together with an immune modulator cost in South Africa. And I'm talking maybe in the future, but can you comment on replacing these two drugs with the newer JAK inhibitors, the trials on them, or the IL-23s? And what I know they're not yet out in their pricing, but the future, maybe three years down the line for South Africa. Um, okay, I don't know in the private sector, but I know that in state sector, tofacitinib did not come in anywhere close to um, the anti-TNF biosimilars. The same for vedolizumab, although I must say the company has been very good in trying to get their prices down. And um, ustekinumab is off the charts expensive. So we don't have uh, the other ones like the reason izumab or vedolizumab, which I believe are sitting with SARPA for approval, but for sure they're going to come in more expensive. So anti-TNF no, and immuno is still cheaper in terms yeah, of... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so in, maybe in, this is, the, maybe this is what we should show to, 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 to funders. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, Reed, good. Um, that's a very good point. And Jill, I've just come back from Echo. And I must say the, the feeling I got there was, you know, your best chance, and we know this, your best chance of of, of cure of, of, of remission is your first chance. And uh, the use of an anti-TNF with the immune modulator gives you 60% remission rates, which were quite startling to me. And the feeling was that if you fail that, you jump straight to an oral agent. And if that's the case, then we will and have we will have to negotiate pricing. I know that tofacitinib is not has not reached the benchmark Humira pricing, which Discovery insists um, you use without co-payment, but that might be the trend that we go for in, in South Africa and in fact, in Sub-Saharan Africa. What do you think about that? I agree hundred percent. So your first shot with the biologic is your best shot, all right? After that, you get more and more failures, essentially. So I agree that in, uh, uh, so the, the, the one exception to that, in fact, is patients who have um, vedolizumab as their first-line therapy. Anti-TNFs actually work pretty well as second-line therapy. So that's a little bit of a caveat to that. But I agree. If you failed a biologic, you can move on to an oral agent. Uh, it will work much better. It doesn't have the immunogenicity that it has. Just remember, in Crohn's, uh, tofacitinib is not approved in Crohn's disease. Yeah. Adacitinib will be, so that will be an option when 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 it and comes. And it, and it looks like and it looks like UPA is really a good drug for both, mm -hmm. and the safety profile is excellent. And we don't have the TB risk here in Africa. Yeah, it's got a very low low TB risk. The risk really is the same as with tofacitinib. The main infection is your herpes zoster infections, the lipids, the spray CK. Um, but of course, unfortunately, it carries the same black box warnings as tofacitinib. Um, all of the JAX as a class carry the black box warnings for uh, major cardiovascular events and uh, venous thromboembolic disease, even though those risks were shown in a rheumatoid arthritis population. So Jill, are we happy with fecal calpro as a biomarker? Um, I mean, I think it kind of predicts who then may relapse once you've stopped. Or is there a hunt for more biomarkers? Oh, sure, there's always a hunt for more biomarkers, but that's the most practical one that we have at the moment. Unfortunately, obviously, patients hate giving stool samples, but it is at this point in time the best. It outperformed CRP. 
So yeah, I'm sure we'll start to see more and more things come out um, as research progresses. But at this point in time, that's that's where we're at. Yeah. But I think we'll also have a problem with the funder saying, well, the FICA couple has, is going up even though the patient is asymptomatic and endoscopically there's no disease for them to actually allow us to start therapy uh, until and unless they are symptomatic or have objective uh, disease, if you know what I mean. But I think fecal calprotectin is a lot cheaper than a colonoscopy. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> that is for sure. And if it's 50, you don't have to subject the patients to scope because you know they're in remission. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Why, why don't we challenge the companies who make Calprotect in the test? It should be cheaper than 800 Rand. It's like doing a UNE. Yeah, it should be cheaper. It? Yeah. I mean, it's sticking a, a litmus paper in a bit of stool. <laughs> oh, they need a <laughs> competitor. Uh, if they got a competitor on the market, it would force them to reduce their price. Yeah, you need a competitor as always, yeah, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ash, I see two questions on the chat. Have we answered them? Yes. There, there, there was Chris's question. Well, it was a comment, and then Kay Carlson. I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Um, to attendees, uh, please ask any questions that you may have. Jill, uh, while I'm waiting for questions, you know, when I was at DDW, there was this idea that <laughs> you could get away with anti TNF monotherapy and then keep the thiopurine in your back pocket for a patient who's losing response or whatever, and then add it on. Um, can you clarify that? Is that a strategy? I'm now talking in terms of cost and obviously risk profile and safety. Uh, if you don't have to use the combination therapy, can you get away with the monotherapy, especially in the Crohn's patient? Just in yes. terms of reducing load and cost and safety. With adalibumab, 100% is a, a, a study called the Diamond Study which showed that the combination of azathioprine with an immunomodulator, sorry, uh, adalibumab with an immunomodulator really didn't change much as opposed to adalibumab monotherapy. So certainly, and the ECHO guidelines recommend that you, in fact, use adalibumab as monotherapy. In fleximab, I think we've got too much data. It's too immunogenic. You have to give it with an immunomodulator. I would never consider giving it as monotherapy unless there was an absolute contraindication to giving... Um, it as a, a dual therapy, a contraindication to methotrexate or thiopurine. And in that case, I think therapeutic drug monitoring is key because the reason that you're giving the immunomodulator is largely to prevent the formation of anti-drug antibodies. Um, and obviously those will reduce the trough level. So if you're forced to give infliximab as monotherapy, you need to do regular trough level checks. You want those trough levels properly therapeutic, otherwise you're gonna get antibodies for sure. Yeah. I think it was in a session they were talking about infliximab, um, but I think it was, uh, I don't know if there was data to support that, but that seemed to be sort of the suggestion of the presenter. And, and I've just, oh, um, Jaka. Hi, Jaka, welcome to the platform. She says, on my observations, CMV has been one of the risks of relapse. What is your experience? I mean, I think we agree, but Joel, go ahead. Okay, so yes, CMV is certainly a risk for relapse or worsening of ulcerative colitis, but not in the setting of uh, discontinuation. It may be, but I certainly haven't come across any data uh, along those lines. I don't know if anybody else has. Um, but certainly in the setting of um, ulcerative colitis, absolutely. See, we always look for CMV when there is a flare-up of disease. Yeah, especially refractory uh, disease. Um, in fact, we have a patient now in the ward uh, who we presented, I think uh, the last time I was on this platform, who um, was just not responding, had a rescue twice, 10 milligrams per kg. Um, and then later on we got the uh, results and it was CMV, she responded very well uh, to um, Ken Steitlover. And in fact, she had a repeat colonoscopy today and her colon is pristine, just with some pseudopolyps but has completely uh, recovered. So yeah. So must in that case, Mash, did you think that this was UC was active UC was superimposed CMV, or do you think the UC was quiescent and she just had CMV? I think it was probably the CMV. Okay. The okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I've just had a thought what about a 6 uh, TG? So, this patient that you presented, could, could if, she, if she relapsed or whatever, would you, if we had it available, would that be an option at all? The, the thioguanines? So 60 G. Uh, in this patient, if she relapsed. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't really want to start to back on azathioprine again because she had the neutropenia and her advanced age. 
but the metabolite, so the 6TG down the pathway, is that also as, as uh, toxic as the actual AVA or 6MP? Um, the, I'm not quite sure of understanding the question, Mesh. So I'm talking about 6TG, the molecule, right? The one that Chris yes. uh, are always, yes. Uh, yes. would that be beneficial at all? It would have the same ultimate. No, it's, all, it's, it's just the end process of exactly the same, same situation, yeah, yeah. So there's no added benefit. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? It seems like there isn't. So um, if that's the case, um, I think I'm going to close. Uh, Joe, thank you always for just a wonderful, comprehensive um, presentations, and I think that really do help us uh, in the management of these uh, very, very complex uh, patients. Uh, and of course, uh, always reviewing the literature so that uh, what we present is uh, evidence driven. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to remind people on the platform, we are dying for cases, literally dying. So please, it's not too late to submit cases uh, of patients that you're managing with IBD, um, and we can have a discussion uh, on the platform so that we can learn from you, learn from the cases uh, as you do from us. So please, we really, really are looking for Absolutely, forward. absolutely. I'm sure everyone doesn't want to hear me give a monologue. So it'd be really yeah. nice to have some real life cases to discuss. <laughs> we don't mind the monologue, but yes, it would be lovely. <laughs> it would be lovely to hear from, from other people. Exactly. And the kind exactly. of patients. You know, absolutely. The then we all learn together. Yeah that the kind of challenges they're experiencing. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Joe. Thank you to uh, the Gastro Foundation uh, for the support and the foresight to start uh, these platforms uh, when, when COVID hit. I think it was a fantastic uh, venture and I think uh, we've grown and we're learning a lot from this. Thank you to uh, Karen and Cheryl who uh, helped us uh, to keep us on the straight and narrow and running uh, these sessions uh, in the background. I want to thank the sponsors as well uh, to all of the activities of the Gastro Foundation. And just to remind you that all of the talks, uh, including the Monday talks uh, with the uh, fellow teaching, they are all on the web, easily accessible, so you can review them at your leisure. And just to remind you that next week is Joa Endoscopy, so please do come back and, and support us. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.